Hello everyone, welcome and welcome back to my channel, I'm in. Phil has a bestie who's making you money, treating you like a queen. What would you do? Matsuyama was like, kill her and replace her. To avoid being caught, she went on the run for 15 years, got 7 plastic surgeries, and started her second life. Single-handedly, she played the Japanese please like a fiddle. With some high-stakes moves, she's got fame and fortune, living the life of a rich lady. She was only 11 hours away from being caught by the statute of limitations. After that, she could become an uncatchable murderer for good. So without further ado, let's start our crazy story for the day. It was the summer of 1982, around 4 p.m. Isabella got out of bed, fixed herself up, getting ready for work. This was her last week working as a hostess. Once she got her paycheck, she'd have enough money to open her own place and be the boss. She felt relieved at the idea of not having to seduce others and entertain them. Well, you know, here's the hostess I meant. These type of hostages in Japan work in bars and clubs to provide companionship and conversation to customers. They create a fun atmosphere by chatting, serving drinks, and sometimes participating in games or performance. It's important to know that their interactions can vary, but they focus on entertainment rather than providing explicit adult services. So that's some um, culture explanations. Let's go back to the story. Just as Isabella was about to leave, the doorbell rang. Opening the door, she was both surprised and delighted. It was her long-lost bestie, Matsuyama. They used to work at a bar together, and in a world of this um, nightlife, they were one of the few pairs who could truly call each other close friends. Both coming from humble backgrounds, navigating the challenges of life, facing setbacks and deceptions, these young girls decided to stick together. When Matsuyama first entered the industry, she was three years younger than Isabella, and Isabella helped her establish herself. Working in the hostage business was far from glamorous. At times, they competed aggressively for clients, even going as far as hiring other people for physical confrontations. The quick cash was too nice, but earning it was not easy, no doubt about that. Without connections, they couldn't make money and could get caught up in scams and ended up owning a lot of money from gambling. Seeing her friend struggling to make ends meet, Isabella decided to help her out by sharing her resources. She introduced clients, made connections, taught negotiating skills, and helped her friend to succeed. And Matsuyama also supported Isabella through difficult times, both financially and emotionally. They value each other more and more after going through both good and bad times together. They even made a promise to be forever friends to the very end of their lives. However, plans didn't really always go as expected, right? Matsuyama changed jobs earlier this year to get a raise and went to work at another bar that's really far away from where Isabella was at. Isabella thought her friend had come a long way to see her, and surely she could be wanted something. Little did she expect, as soon as her friend entered, she knelt down in tears. Dear friend, please, I'm being chased by long sharks, and I have no money. Can you lend me a hundred grand for emergencies? Hearing this, Isabella looked hesitant. Even though she had that amount of cash, it was the hard-earned money she had saved for a long time as capital to open her own shop. She didn't want to give up on her dreams and 
couldn't bear to make things difficult for her friend either, so she proposed a compromise and suggested to Matsuyama, saying, "I'm about to open my store and the funds are a bit tight right now. Can you wait a few days?" Before she could finish, Matsuyama's face suddenly changed. She pushed Isabella away and rushed into her home, angrily pointed at her nose. "You liar! You have so much gold, silver, and jewelry at home. More than you can wear. All those wealthy clients of yours gave them to you. Selling just a couple of pieces could save my life. Why wouldn't you want to help me?" Although they had their share of conflicts during their long friendships, Matsuyama's current demeanor was a first. Isabella was stunned, but more than that, she felt angry. Her dear friend, whom she had helped and supported, was now insulting and accusing her for the sake of borrowing money. What she found even more unacceptable was that the money she had taught. Matsuyama to earn was many times more than this a hundred grand, like a bucket of cold water being poured on her. She felt that all her sincerity had gone to waste. With Matsuyama's continuous insults ringing in her ears, Isabella, unable to bear it any longer, slapped her. But in the next moment, she started blaming herself. Sorry. Had barely left her lips when something even more shocking happened. Matsuyama brought a tie from God knows where to strangle Isabella, because she struck from behind. Isabella didn't get to react to the attack until she couldn't breathe. She realized that her best friend was killing her. Isabella was screaming, struggling, and trying her best to push away Matsuyama. But because she reacted way too late, and her brain was lack of oxygen, she didn't have the energy to yell while she was losing control of her limbs. She felt that Matsuyama was as immovable as a mountain. So not long after that, she died. Matsuyama only stopped when she noticed that Isabella had her face turned purple. She nudged her a few times. But her bestie was like a melty ice cream lying on the floor. It was then Matsuyama realized Isabella was dead. She wasn't afraid or feeling remorse or anything. Instead, Matsuyama had a feeling of revenge because she couldn't remember since when she started to envy her best friend, even though her best friend taught her everything. Guiding her on how to navigate through life and how to make money, she couldn't make as much money as her friend. The gifts from clients were not as valuable as her friends. This resentment was firmly lodged in her heart. Just the thought of going to jail because of Isabella made her sick as well. But she knew what she had done, so running away felt like the only option. You can't imagine that Matsuyama, who has lost all sense of decency, could actually pull off such a sophisticated move. This is also one of the most perfect and chilling real escape plans in Japanese crime history. Matsuyama knew she couldn't just let the body rot in there. She needed to get rid of it, and she thought she couldn't deal with it all by herself, right? So who should her call for help? Her boyfriend. They've been in love for many years, even though they never registered for marriage. Matsuyama had given birth to three sons and a daughter for him. Regardless of their relationship, she had a way to get her boyfriend to help her, especially for the sake of the kids. However, having killed someone, she needed to come up with a decent excuse, right? She had a brilliant idea. After setting up the plot, Matsuyama made the phone call and summoned her boyfriend. When her boyfriend arrived to Isabella's place and saw the body, he was scared out of his wits, trembling all over. 
Seeing that the timing was right, Matsuyama started her tearful performance. Isabella used to borrow money from me every now and then, and I never said no once. Little did I know she took the money and lent her and lived a life of luxury. Poor kids at home can't even afford medical treatment. I, I, I just came to get my money back. Who would have thought she'd not only refused to pay back, but also wanted to kill me? I just defended myself, and I never thought it would come to this. The more Matsuyama spoke, the more emotional she became. She collapsed into her boyfriend's arms, crying uncontrollably. Hearing about his girlfriend being taken advantage of, the boyfriend got angry, and he said, as she had expected. Now what's done is done. What do you want me to do? I will help you. The two of them stayed in Isabella's flat until late at night, waiting for the neighbors to fall asleep. Matsuyama wrapped the body in a blanket, loaded it into her boyfriend's car, and headed towards the nearest woods at night. They didn't dare to linger, tossing the body into the secluded spot and quickly driving away. After disposing of the body, Matsuyama felt a huge weight off her shoulders. It's very hot, the weather. The body will start to decay soon. No one will ever able to connect it back to them. But the boyfriend was feeling a lot of pressure. He just wanted to go home and end this nightmare before daylight. But Matsuyama was determined to stick to her plans. You know. Holding tightly onto the steering wheel, we are not going home, darling. We are going to Isabella's place. She owes me, and I'm going to collect it all. Matsuyama declared. Hearing these words, the boyfriend thought Matsuyama had gone mad. He couldn't believe how greedy his partner was. Though he usually obeyed his girlfriend's every command, he dared not defy her now. And so the two returned to Isabella's place. Matsuyama entered by herself and quickly found where the money, jewelry, and safe were located. She took all of it, calculating the value. This money would be enough for her to live the good life, not working for three years at least. As for the boyfriend, he was an accomplice now, and she wasn't afraid of betrayal under such. Circumstances. She also thought that the Japanese police were a bunch of slackers. As long as she wasn't caught within three days, she would be out of the danger zone. Before Matsuyama could relax, two days later, the police called. To be on the safe side, Matsuyama had her boyfriend put to call on speakerphone. The police had received a report discovering Isabella's body in the woods. With a witness providing clues, they suspected that Isabella had met Matsuyama before her death. Matsuyama didn't expect the Japanese police, a bunch of useless individuals in her eyes, would suspect her so quickly. Listening to the police questioning her boyfriend about her, Matsuyama, who was huddled on the side, felt her heart in chaos. Compared to the murder itself, this time. The fear of being caught made her tremble. She knew that her boyfriend was awake in mind. If the police kept questioning him, trouble would come sooner or later. She had worked so hard to achieve this wonderful life that was just to start. How could she throw it all away? Before she could decide what to do next, her boyfriend's words. Came at her like a surprise attack. Darling, why don't you just turn yourself in? Since it's self-defense, with a good attitude, you can probably get a lighter sentence. The kids and I will be waiting for you to come home. Upon hearing the words "turning yourself in," Matsuyama exploded like a cat whose tail had been stepped on. Turn myself in. Absolutely not! If you want to go, go by yourself. She couldn't come up with a better idea. 
but she knew that her boyfriend was not reliable anymore. So she decided to ditch her boyfriend and save herself a loan. On the same night, they received a phone call. Matsuyama slipped away from her boyfriend and for kids under the cover of darkness. The only things she took with her were the treasures she had looted from her best friend's place. This time, luck was on her side. Two days later, finally the police got to narrow it down to Matsuyama herself. So the police visited Matsuyama and her boyfriend's place but only found the boyfriend himself. So they brought him back for interrogation. As Matsuyama speculated, her timid boyfriend would surely confess to the crime in the shortest possible time. However, to her surprise, her boyfriend unexpectedly turned into a loyal dog, refusing to admit Matsuyama's guilt even at the cost of his own life. The police interrogated him for 10 days with no success. Just when the police thought this lead was about to run cold, a man named Sam brought a turning point to the case. He reported his fiancé missing and provided a photo. The police upon seeing the photo were petrified. Wasn't this Matsuyama? Oddly, the man Sam insisted that his fiancé wasn't named Matsuyama or anything but Harper. She's born rich. At least that's what he thought. The police were bewildered. Could there really be two different people who look literally identical in this world? And they are not twins. They immediately launched an investigation and the result left everyone stunned. Harper was indeed Matsuyama. When her boyfriend, the one was interrogated by the police, learned about the news, his world shattered into pieces. Couldn't fathom how they lived on a modest income with Matsuyama, had to work as a hostess to supplement their household expenses. How could she have the money to pretend to be someone that is bomb rich? That doesn't make sense, right? Besides that, the police dropped another bombshell. Your girlfriend, Matsuyama, hasn't been a hostess for a long time. This guy, Sam, has been sponsoring her. The boyfriend was completely blown away when he found out he had been cheated on in such a way. So he slammed his fist on the table and made a decision on the spot. He would cooperate with the police to expose this love scammer. Meanwhile, Matsuyama had already traveled to multiple places, marking the first significant achievement in her life on the run. After some thinking, she came up with the brilliant idea again. After leaving her boyfriend, Matsuyama plunged into the bustling streets of Osaka. Here is a diverse community. The police won't be able to investigate easily, she thought, temporarily feeling less anxious. The first thing Matsuyama did upon arriving in Osaka was clean out money from Isabella's bank account. As the investigation progressed, the police would likely trace these accounts. Instead of risking being checked due to withdrawing money, she decided to convert everything into cash from the start. You know, all in one go. Nothing feels safer than having a lot of money in her pouch, right? After withdrawing the money, Matsuyama meticulously counted it. Now she had over 2 million yen on her, a decent amount for the journey. But when she entered a convenience store, Craving a piece of bread, she was shocked to see the news on the store's television. The broadcast featured hostages found dead in the woods, and her own photo was displayed among the wanted suspects. Matsuyama's girl tingled instantly, and she fled in panic. It wasn't until she reached a deserted dead end that she dared to stop, gasping for breath. No, 
people will recognize me soon based on the photo. I need to find a way to make Matsuyama disappear, she thought. So what would she do? Yep, you bet it. Plastic surgery. In Japan, where cosmetic surgery is advanced, getting a new face isn't that difficult. But Matsuyama was clearly smarter than the average fugitive. She understood the principle of not putting all her eggs into one basket. She wasted no time, setting off that day for Tokyo, known as the capital of plastic surgery at the time, taking advantage of the gaps in information spreading between cities. She quickly found a retired doctor in a private clinic and got double eyelid surgery. The next day, before her eyes could fully recover from swelling, she went to Yokohama and raised her nose. After spending a week in Yokohama, Matsuyama set off again, returning to Osaka for a lip augmentation. She changed her makeup style, adopting a new look with bold eyebrows and large, very curves. In a series of swift maneuvers, Matsuyama, in a short period, managed to conceal the most distinctive features on her face. Because of her caution, no plastic surgery clinic could provide a photo of her royal face, like the complete one. Looking at herself in the mirror, Matsuyama finally braced a sign of relief. From then on, Matsuyama's face disappeared from the world. Just when she relaxed and ready to embrace her new life, reality gave her another harsh slap. Due to unrestrained plastic surgeries, the money had long run out. After careful calculation, she had only a week's worth of food expenses left. Most people would have given up long ago, right? But for Matsuyama, who had begged for food with her mother since childhood, this was nothing at all. No cash? She'd find a way to make some. Matsuyama gave herself a new name, Scarlet. With the remaining money, she bought a ticket and arrived in Nagoya. She purposely tried walking on the streets, and no one could recognize her. Feeling confident, she found a bar in the area and resumed her work as the hostess. With the business skills taught by her best friend, Isabella, she outdoed other native hostesses. In just six months, she became a top seller. Countless customers came every night to catch a glimpse of Matsuyama's beauty. From executives of construction companies to factory managers, they all fell at her feet. Matsuyama was not idle either. She selected a few influential men and maintained ambiguous relationships with them, so that these men eagerly provided her with living expenses and gifts. Easily, Matsuyama started living the life she had once envied Isabella for. However, she was still not satisfied. She knew that playing around and making a scene would be both exhausting and risky. Not only did she want to outsmart the police, but she also wanted to live a better and happier life than Isabella could have ever had. She aimed to choose a wealthy client for stable cohabitation and secure a double insurance for her later years. Soon enough, Matsuyama had her sights set on two potential targets. One of them was Adam, a rich and good-looking young lad who was known for having his charming personalities. The other was Michael, a slightly older man who owned a dessert shop. Michael may not be very rich, but his strong morals and reliability are what make him stand out for someone looking for material security and lacking money. Adam would be the obvious choice, but Matsuyama had different priorities. Remembering Isabella's advice that in relationships, people matter more than money, Matsuyama chose to join hands with Michael. 
Although she missed out on becoming a rich man's wife, handling a man like Michael was a piece of cake for her. What made her even happier was that Michael's shop was located in the remote city of Kanazawa. For a fugitive like her, a more secluded place was much safer, right? And so Matsuyama embraced the persona of a vulnerable woman. Who had escaped from an abusive husband, through her sweet talk and acting, Matsuyama smoothly gained Michael's sympathy and love. A few months later, Matsuyama moved in with Michael, officially becoming the lady of the dessert shop. Matsuyama moved from being a worker to a management role and didn't plan on stopping there. She decided to use her skills to boost Michael's dessert business. Matsuyama upgraded the products. She not only introduced seasonal specials, but also implemented hunger marketing targets in the shop. Just a short year, Michael's dessert shop became a trendy spot that, that everyone wanted to visit. Its popularity soared to the point where even tourists from Tokyo made the trip. The locals knew about a capable assistant running the show at Michael's. Which is Matsuyama, just as Matsuyama was basking in the glory of her exceptional abilities. A surprise fell into her lap. Michael proposed to her. When Matsuyama saw Michael sincerely and down on one knee, she couldn't control her expression. Was she moved? Absolutely. But she couldn't make a move either. I want to marry you. Have lots and lots of children with you and pass down the shop together," Michael said. Hearing these words, Matsuyama's heart sank. She desperately wanted to tell Michael not to love her because it would lead to consequences. Getting married meant that they are going to this registration office, you know, requiring identification. Wouldn't that expose her as a fugitive? With these thoughts, Matsuyama decided to turn the tables, improvising her strategy. She flopped down, kneeling in front of Michael, and began her act. Michael, I'm sorry. I escaped from my hometown years ago, and all my documents are there. I couldn't go back to get them, as my ex-husband would kill me on the spot. I don't mind dying, but if it goes after our children. Seeing his beloved in tears, Michael's heart shattered. He consoled himself, thinking, "Why bother with marriage? As long as the one I love is by my side, what does it matter, right?" He literally changed his mind just like that. And I can think of a million ways to get these documents with an abusive man at home like that. But oh well, I guess Michael didn't have these ideas back then. As the saying goes, those who are favored always act recklessly. Taking advantage of Michael's love, Matsuyama started to hatch some more plans. Since Michael wanted to marry her in order to have kids and carry on the family name, and Matsuyama thought it wouldn't be practical for her to have. Children of her own with him. Instead, she decided to find a ready-made child to silence Michael. He wanted children. The first kid Matsuyama thought of was her eldest son. That evening, she wrote a letter to her son back in her hometown. The gist of the letter was simple: "Miss you, come quickly." Matsuyama also promised to arrange a job for her son and provide room and board. But he had to keep it a secret from his dad and other siblings, and so Matsuyama brought her son to Michael's shop, where he became a long-distance delivery driver. To everyone, Matsuyama claimed he was her nephew from her hometown. With Michael now playing the role of a delighted father, the topic of marriage was no longer brought up. Matsuyama finally enjoyed a life of wealth, leisure, a husband, and a son. You know, family. So 
she even entertained the idea of giving up on her life on the run. Maybe it's time to live out my later years peacefully like this. However, karma always has its way of coming back around. At that time, Matsuyama's biological son, unaware of the unfolding events, was about to face the consequences of his murderous actions. In early 1986, Matsuyama's son got into a traffic accident during a delivery. Michael, being the shop owner, accompanied him to the police station for questioning, right? It was during this process that Michael unintentionally glimpsed at Matsuyama's son's driver's license where he sought the registered address. This seemingly innocent glance almost blew Matsuyama's cover. A few days later, Michael's relatives unexpectedly visited to discuss matters related to these um, ancestral offerings, and Matsuyama and Michael refrained from participating. During the gathering, coincidentally, the news about the murder of a hostage started airing on TV. Initially disregarded by others, Michael, who had consumed a bit too much alcohol, suddenly pointed at the television. That place, I, I know that place. It's where that young man in my shop is from. And look, the address seemed quite close. The casual remark sparked intense suspicions in Michael's sister. You know, her brother was with Matsuyama for two years, both running the shop and they look very happy together. But Matsuyama always raised up excuses to refuse to get married. She didn't know why, but this bold speculation suddenly appeared in her mind. Perhaps this Scarlet was having some connection with the fugitive Matsuyama. Michael's sister decided to give Matsuyama a try. The next day, she invited Matsuyama to her home for some um, family thing. When she saw Matsuyama, Michael's sister was baffled. The woman in front of her looked completely different from the wanted photo. She had been mistaken. Just to be safe, she popped the question. Is Charlotte's hometown also there like it on the TV? My brother mentioned that your nephew brought from your hometown has a registered address there. This question made Matsuyama's blood run cold. I have family roots there, but I was raised in a different area. Only a few relatives still live in there and it's been a long time since I last visited. Matsuyama tried her best to steady her voice. Hearing this, Michael's sister didn't press further. Matsuyama knew that the safe house she had cultivated for many years was no longer safe. It was time to bail. Meanwhile, Michael's sister, feeling something was still off, decided to call the police finally. The police, confused by Matsuyama's current appearance, hesitated to confirm. However, procedures had to be followed, even if it was a misunderstanding, right? When they arrived at the shop, Matsuyama had already slipped away again. After saying goodbye to Michael's sister, she didn't even go home. Grabbing a bicycle from the roadside, she rode like a crazy. Unbelievably, she managed to cover 16 kilometers and reached the train station. Overnight, the shop she meticulously managed, and the family life she worked hard to maintain vanished into thin air. Matsuyama finally lost her composure in the train bathroom. I'm tired. Maybe, maybe I should just stop running and go to jail. For the first time since killing her best friend, she felt the pain. She had lost everything now, and being older and running away seemed like a joke. In the emotional turmoil, Matsuyama drifted into sleep. In her dreams, she found herself back at 17. 
nine meters strong and my tremor woke up in a cold sweat. Screaming. No, no, I can't get caught. Even if I die, I want to die on the outside. Setting food on the run once again, Masuyama found herself without money and nowhere to go. Her nerves became even more strained after the experience with Michael's sister. She didn't stay in one place for more than three months now. Even if she had to stay in a hotel, she made sure to sleep next to the fire escape. But this time, the police were serious, casting a white net everywhere. They issued a one million yen reward, hoping that people nationwide would join the manhunt. One of these、um, first few hospitals that did plastic surgery on Matsuyama contributed another four million yen to the reward because they felt like they were partly responsible for letting her escape for so many years. For a while. A nationwide wave of people tracking Masuyama swept across Japan. Masuyama's situation became increasingly dire. Frantically on the run, she, who could have made ends meet by doing odd jobs like being a waitress or a janitor, now resembled a scaredy cat. She couldn't afford to be even in public during the day. With no money to pay for accommodation, she could only compete with the homeless for a spot near the garbage dump. Sometimes, with bad luck, she had nowhere to sleep at all. In her desperate situation, she suddenly noticed a burrito in the distance that was hiring. In an instant, she saw a way out. If I don't start making money soon, I might end up starving before I get caught. Trade sex with bread is worthy at this point. She initially planned to be prostitute for a short time, but it ended up lasting for ten years. The sex industry had a diverse range of personnel, and confidentiality was well maintained. No information was exchanged, whether it was about the customers' identities or the girls working there. Besides her, a murderer. There were also people from the underworld, you know, drug dealers and others, that wanted to hide their identities. This turned out to be Matsuyama's unintentional sanctuary. Despite this, she remained vigilant. She stayed away from people and never went out except for work. Plus, she didn't even order food or go shopping at all. She transformed her life into that of a complete recluse. Most people couldn't endure such a life, but Matsuyama seemed quite okay with it. She was even counting the days. She knew that no matter how bad the crime was, the law only allowed for prosecution within fifteen years. Once that period passed, she could be completely free. Even if she strolled into a police station, no one could touch her. Finally, this day in July, 1997, arrived. Masuyama flipped open her calendar, contently making a cross on the last day of the stages of limitations. This day, she had been waiting for too long. From today onwards, she was completely free. At least that's what she thought. All the pent-up emotions of the past could finally burst out, and she was determined to celebrate. So she put on a dress she usually wouldn't wear, did her makeup beautifully, and headed to a local pub. Matsuyama's beauty caught the attention of all the men in the bar. They bought her drinks, and she welcomed their advances. Instead of shying away, she playfully flirted back. As the atmosphere heated up, the entire place started cheering. After downing a few bottles of alcohol, Matsuyama decided to vent a little. She put her arms around one guy's shoulder and loudly asked, "Hey, do you think I look a bit like that criminal suspect, Matsuyama?" Though the drunk patron paid little attention, the pub owner grew suspicious. Because the police knew that Matsuyama had undergone multiple plastic surgeries, 
identifying her based solely on her appearance was challenging. They broadcasted Matsuyama's voice nationwide, hoping people would recognize her by voice. It was precisely the voice in that sentence that made the owner certain Matsuyama was the fugitive. After Matsuyama left, the owner quickly reported it to the police. Nine days later, Matsuyama, revealing in her newfound freedom, returned to the pub to jaunt her sorrow. Little did she know that the police, who had been lying in bed, would arrest her on the spot. Ironically. When faced with the police, Matsuyama just stood there, stunned, offering no resistance as she obediently put on the handcuffs. She wasn't afraid of being caught now, because the statutes of limitations had expired. However, a single sentence from the police changed everything. You were one month away from the real statute of limitations. It turned out that Matsuyama had miscalculated. She had only been on the run for fifteen years and eleven months. She couldn't fathom that her actual effective period of escape was one month shorter than she had thought, and it was this mistake that allowed police to apprehend her in the final stage. But no one could anticipate that her capture wouldn't mark the end of the case. For over a decade, while busy evading capture, she never skipped her special training. Every night, she stimulated interrogation process in her mind. Her goal was simple: if the day came when she got caught, she'd use her flawless skills to leave the police hopeless. Even if she couldn't walk away scot-free, getting a lighter sentence would be good enough. So, when facing the authorities, Masuyama remained calm. After sobering up, she pulled out her forged ID and skillfully started her performance. "I'm Alice, and here's my ID. I don't know any Masuyama," she said, looking the police officer straight in the eyes, sounding natural, relaxed, and as steady as an old pro. But as they say, if you play with the fire. You get burned. For over a decade, she didn't know that the police investigative techniques had evolved. When the pub owner reported her, the police collected the cup she drank from, using fingerprints and DNA matching. They had solid evidence that she she, she was she was herself. <laughs> At this point, everyone thought she would confess and face justice. With evidence in hand. What more could she conjure? Well, Matsuyama had one more trick up her sleeve to exploit the procedural aspects of police work and buy herself more time. So, facing round after round of questioning, she remained tight-lipped. As long as her statement couldn't be promptly submitted to the prosecutor's office, they couldn't charge her. She counted the days, aiming to drag the prosecution's deadline past and secure her freedom. But she had a wild card, and the police had their own plans. They prepared a significant move for Matsuyama. Just two days before the prosecution period expired, the police brought her children into the interrogation room. Seeing her other kids, Matsuyama couldn't hold back. After years on the run, apart from her eldest son, she had forgotten what the others looked like. If you continue to resist, you will never see them again. They won't. Finally, breaking down, Matsuyama signed her real name on the confession letter. It was the 18th of August, 1997, at 2 p.m. With the relentless efforts of various police personnel. The indictment was finally submitted to court. At this point, less than eleven hours remained before expiration of the prosecution period. November two thousand and three, Matsuyama was sentenced to life imprisonment. She's going to spend the rest of the days behind bars. 
the priest who played a fifteen-year cat and mouse game with her couldn't resist their curiosity and hit her with the question, "Why didn't you turn yourself in, especially after giving through so much hardships?" After all, Japanese law is generally lenient, and even for murder, it's challenging to get the death penalty. Right before entering prison, Matsuyama finally provided an answer to this puzzling behavior, revealing an even more ironic twist. Back when she was seventeen, Matsuyama got sentenced to six years in prison for stealing with her then boyfriend. Due to the social upheaval in Japan at the time, the police arrested a bunch of gang members, mafias. Once behind the bars, these gang members or mafias didn't see themselves as mere criminals. They initially bribed the prison guards and later set their sights on female inmates. And Matsuyama happened to be one of their targets. It started in an evening. These male gang member prisoners somehow got into Matsuyama's cell, and they brutally violated her. All of them, together, sexually abused Matsuyama, the 17-year-old girl. In the usual hustle and bustle of the prison routine, where guards would show up at the drop of a pin, it was as if they suddenly turned a deaf ear, completely oblivious. This peculiar silence persisted for about six months. It wasn't until a group of released female inmates joined forces and exposed the situation to the media that things had changed. The revelation caused quite a stir at the time. To hush up this scandal, the prison where Matsuyama was held hastily transferred her and the other victims. To a different facility overnight, but you know what? She was raped again in this prison, and this time it wasn't any of these gang members. It was the prison guard. Masuyama swore to expose the wrongdoing of the prison to the world, but to avoid exposing flaws in this、um, judicial systems, prisons decided to settle the matter privately. They offered Masuyama. Hush money and allowed her early release. However, this experience made her afraid of the prisons, like with the plague. Even killing her best friend with her own hands couldn't compare to the fear brought by her time behind bars. After sixteen months in prison, Matsuyama, aged fifty-seven, passed away due to illness. She was cremated in prison. And her ashes were taken away by her eldest son. Until her last moment, she never responded to the heart-wrenching accusations from her best friend's family. The most blood-boiling aspect was the letter Matsuyama left behind. I've always been a weak woman, needing a man to survive. So I wanted to get married, have children, and own a lively home. But in the end, I got nothing, not even genuine love. Later, Matsuyama's 15 years of life on the run were adapted into a movie. Due to the extremely heinous nature of the case and its significant impact, Japan amended the Criminal Procedure Code in April 2010. The time limit for prosecuting murder cases that result in death has been removed. And this change applies to all cases, regardless of when they occurred. Finally, our story ends here, and I will see you in my next video.